I've always felt the best in my life about what I'm doing, where I'm doing it and why I'm doing it when I'm part of a like highly successful team where I can bring my whole self. So the opportunity to create that kind of environment is super, super appealing to me. Hey there, I'm Graham and you're listening to the Sales Nerds Live podcast. I've always been inspired by and drawn to the mentors in my life. And I've had the experience of having some amazing mentors. So the opportunity to hopefully be that for someone else in some capacity, that to me is what was the biggest draw to leadership and what I find the most rewarding about leadership. On today's episode of Sales Nerds Live, host Graham Collins welcomes occupier head of sales, Jacob Walker. The two friends and former coworkers explore what it means to embrace failure, how to mentor people on an individual level to ensure they're growing professionally, and more. Sales Nerds Live is brought to you by your friends at Quotapath. Quotapath removes the manual lift out of sales commissions by automating the compensation process. We calculate and track your team's commissions, prepare them for payouts, and even give your reps the ability to forecast attainment and future earnings. We're the only solution loved by reps, leadership, and finance. Come nerd out with us on Sales Nerds Live. I think we are live. I am Graham Collins, and welcome everybody to this week's edition or this month's edition of Sales Nerds Live. Uh, Today's topic is leading with a mentor mentality. And our guest is Jacob Walker, head of sales at Occupier. Welcome, Jacob. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I brought a little bit of Texas weather here uh, to Boston, Massachusetts this week. Yeah, we we, we traded positions. I'm normally (laughs) up in Maine. I'm down in Austin and and Jacob's normally down in Austin and he's he's up in in Beantown. So yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a little steamy up there. So Jacob, can you, before we dive in, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us a little bit about Occupier and why you're here talking to us today. Well, first and foremost, thanks for having me. For those who I haven't met, I'm Jacob Walker, like Graham said, head of sales at Occupier. Occupier is a lease management and life cycle management platform in the commercial real estate space. So we work with brands like Shake Shack and Bonobos to help them take control of their entire real estate portfolio, ultimately make data-driven and decisions about how they fuel their growth. So that's a little bit about us. Uh, we were founded back in 2018. And I recently joined about four months ago to help figure out the playbook and the process and to scale the sales team. So what is what does bringing a mentor mentality mean to me in the context of this new role? Uh, well, fundamentally, I'm in the people business. No matter what I do as a sales leader, it's my job to help people. And this is my career mission statement. Uh, give them the knowledge, the skills, and the opportunities to learn, grow, and succeed. Got it. Yeah. You answered the first question, which is what the, what that means to lead with a mentor mentality. Um, I really want to unpack the um, what you just said about, about your mission statement. I think that's a really powerful thing. Before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into leadership, what your what your career track looked like to, to get you into leadership? I was a liberal arts background in college who had the benefit of going to going to grad school. I knew I wanted to be in tech. I'd been exposed to the tech world a little bit. Um, so I jumped in and got a job as uh, an SDR at Oracle uh, and then ended up making the decision for a lot of reasons to jump into the startup world. Uh, so I spent some time as an SDR at an AE and then got the opportunity to start leading teams, which Ultimately, it was the right decision for me because I've always felt the best in my life about what I'm doing, where I'm doing it, and why I'm doing it when I'm part of a like highly successful team where I can bring my whole self, uh, where I can bounce ideas off of other people and experiment and, and really just engage in the meritocracy of ideas. So the opportunity to create that kind of environment is super, super appealing to me. That's great. Yeah. And you... you um we're in an individual contributor role for a period of time. I mean, it sounds like a few different individual contributors. What is, what drew you to say, like, I'm not going to stick it out in the individual contributor role. And and what was it about leadership where you were like, I had to, I don't know, it was there one moment or one thing where you were like, that's, that's it that I want to be a leader. There wasn't like one lightning bolt moment. Um, I think for me throughout my life, whether it was sports or work or school, um, I've always been, inspired by and drawn to the mentors in my life. And I've had the experience of having some amazing mentors. Uh, so the opportunity to hopefully be that for someone else in some capacity, that to me is what was the biggest draw to leadership and what I find the most rewarding about leadership. I'm with you. I feel like 
and I, I was an individual cr- contributor for a period of time and, and I found more satisfaction out of people on my team and people that I worked with succeeding than than myself succeeding. Um, so I am with you. So, all right. So let's let's go back to the the mission statement that you laid out. Can you repeat that for me? It's my job uh, to help people gain the knowledge, skills, and opportunities to learn, grow, and succeed. Let's um, look at learn, grow, and succeed. So, mm-hmm. what does learning mean to you, and how do you facilitate doing that as a mentor? I mean, it's all about approaching things with the growth mindset. So I think one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was if you're not learning and you're not growing, you need to evaluate uh, where you are and what you're doing. So I very much approach my career and I try and I try and facilitate the people on my team to do the same. A big part of learning is failure, particularly in the startup space, like in the context of, of my job here at Occupier we're in a period of radical experimentation. And so the learning process, you don't learn as much through success as you do through failure. So one of the first things that I tell people, like in my first one-on-one with them, when they join my team is you are going to fail. Good. I want you to, let's talk about what you learned. Yeah. Let's share that with the team and then let's move forward. I feel like I'm, I'm doing a job interview question here, uh, but can you <laughs> tell me about a time you failed and, and oh, something that man. you learned from it? <laughs> yeah. So um, I think for me, uh, so recently we've, I've been toying with messaging with our SDR team, like a lot of, a lot of sales leaders do. Uh, and what I failed to do was understand the buyer context in which I was approaching or which we were approaching Occupier. So basically I tried to fluff up a lot of our messaging and use a little bit of buzzwords, which if you know me, you know, I'm a big idiom guy or analogy guy. So I failed to keep it simple in that our pro- our product here at Occupier solves fundamentally very simple problems, but they're very painful problems. So staying as close to those problems when you're talking to customers is really important using plain English and not trying to over-engineer your messaging. So obviously, because our messaging was off, our response rate dipped. And ultimately, we ended up learning through that failure. That's awesome. So, all right. So we uh, we covered learn, grow, and sorry, what was the third one again? Succeed. Yeah. Succeed. Okay. All right. Well, succeed, we'll, we'll get to and, and what sure. that looks like. Um, so grow, how, how do you, how do you mentor your, your team to grow? Again, it, it's all about connecting with people on a human level. I think, um, we spend so much of our lives working and, and in the context of, oh, I'm a head of sales at Occupier, or, oh, I'm an AE at Occupier that, um, I really want to make sure that I connect with people on a human level, understand, Hey, what do you want out of this thing? Because chances are you're not going to be an occupier forever. You're going to move on and do other things. You may even move out of selling. Like, how can I help you? How can I help facilitate your growth? So it starts with things like, what's your relationship with work? Uh, how do you approach conflict? Like, what do you want to learn? What are you interested in? Uh, from there, if we're talking about nuts and bolts of sales leadership, I think it's really important that you provide a somewhat of a choose your own adventure as far as a career path goes, particularly within the startup environment. So yes, there's a traditional SDR to AE to senior AE to strategic AE, whatever your organization calls it. But I think for me, uh, the most interesting companies and interesting roles that I've been in have been the opportunity where I've gotten to color outside the lines a little bit. I think it's one of the things that draws me most to the startup space is I can work with someone who says, hey, I'm actually really interested in like nerding out on the data behind uh, our response rate, for example. And so I said, that's awesome. Like, why don't you go meet with our head of revenue operations, pull the data, come back and give a brief to the team on like, here's what we're seeing in the data. Here's what we should do about it. Facilitating those kind of opportunities on a day to day, that helps fuel people's growth. That's awesome. That's great. I mean, and and. I think that enabling people to make those decisions themselves or or go out and do things themselves is incredibly powerful because oftentimes with managers who don't necessarily have the mentor mentality, they they'll just go and do it. You know, oh yeah, hey, so and so said that our our email cadences aren't working. And so a traditional manager may go say, say, okay, thanks for the inf- information, go do an analysis on it, rewrite all the cadences, and then come back and present it. Whereas a, a mentor mentality, if I'm understanding correctly, the way that you might handle that is to go and say, okay, let's figure out this problem together. I'll, I will mm-hmm. enable you and I will remove the barriers for you to be able to solve this problem, even if it's not necessarily their their job at that moment, um, mm-hmm. they get to, to answer those questions themselves. 
Yeah, absolutely. And typically what I've found is anybody, people generally have the right answer or they're very close. Uh, so what I do is, this is a very tactical thing for the people leaders listening. Uh, I employ what's called the Socratic method of coaching. And so I have people come to me with a problem and say, hey, I'm not sure what I should do in this situation. The first thing that I ask them is, well, what do you think you should do? Right. More often than not, people are on the right track. And so it's showing them, hey, I don't have monopoly on good ideas. Like you're, you have the autonomy to be creative in here and you're also right. So then it's helping them take the next step to, from ideation to execution. That's great. That's great. And I've, I've employed a similar methodology in the past. Um, and what I've found is that if you do that, enough times people learn or, or get annoyed with you enough of you <laughs> asking, what do you think you should do that? They actually come to you with that. And they say, yeah. Hey, Jacob, I've identified problem X. This is how I'm thinking about it. This is the, the solution that I'm proposing. Poke holes in it. Tell me where, where I'm wrong. Like, what do you think? What do you think? What, what is your take on it? And that is just such a better way of thinking about it. And if you do that, if you coach people enough to, to approach problems that way, mm -hmm they do it instinctively and then you don't have to ask the the how would you handle it uh, yeah there's one really important underpinning here that we've kind of been dancing around that i want to i want to hone in on specifically that interaction does not happen if you don't establish a culture of trust and vulnerability right. on your team i think right. for me culture eats strategy for breakfast again there's another now there's another idiom for you okay. but it really is real so like if you don't create an environment where people want to bring those ideas to each other and, and pressure test them and bow and and work with each other then leading with a mentor mentality is next to impossible yeah yeah i i, I completely agree so trust is a important topic among leaders and i think that oftentimes leaders confuse their reps trusting them with their reps liking them and mm -hmm. that is you know that it's an easy way to get people to trust you is to have them like you but right. it also can be a double-edged sword because if you're friends with all of your reps that's that's very dangerous as well and mm -hmm. so can you tell me how you build that trust with people without yeah. just without relying entirely on like being a nice guy and and having people like you yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, so I think it's setting really clear expectations, like from the get go with these people. I'm really, number one, like care about the whole person. Like don't like this, the person joining your team is not just a cell in a spreadsheet or a like he a head count on a revenue model. That's a human being with wants and needs and struggles and triumphs. Like you should, if you're leading from the right place, you should authentically care about those things and not just give the old, oh, hey, how you doing? Good. Okay, cool. I got the personal stuff out of the way. Let's move on. Um, and there's the flip side of that coin is selling, setting really clear expectations around, hey, sometimes I'm going to have to be your boss. Like that doesn't mean that we can't like that we can't like each other or enjoy each other's company or have conflict. But there are some times where like I got to be your manager and that's okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I've had I've had really rough situations with that where managing your friends can be very tough. I've had situations yeah. where they were my friends before they were my employees, and yeah. it makes a lot of conversations very difficult. So uh, it, it can be a, a delicate balance, um, but that's, that's good to hear. And, and and hearing you talk about caring about the whole person, um, mm -hmm. is, is that something you got from a book? Is that something that you've you've done research on? How, where did you come up with that methodology? Um, I mean, I don't think it's more, it, I don't think it's necessarily like a methodology or a framework and this is gonna sound pretty woo woo, but I think it's like, right. fundamentally, who do I want to be as a person? Like, yeah. do I want to be somebody who shows up and, and engages and, and cares? Or do I want to be somebody who just kind of blows through the personal stuff because I feel like I have to, in order to get to, uh, whatever it is that comes next. And I think, again, like hearkening back to the best mentors that I've had in my life, those are the people who have invested in me most, both in terms of like the functional mentorship that they provide me, but then also like investing in me as a human being as a whole. Yeah, that's great. And, and I know that I've worked with managers who struggle a little bit with that because they just aren't, uh, they don't have the same you know, they're just not as personable, I guess, if yeah. you will. And so I, I think that there are ways to do this as well, care about the whole person as well, without Absolutely. having to be the, you know, I mean, a, 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 as personable, essentially. Yeah. And so I, the the one 
thing that really resonates with me is the motivation and mm-hmm. identify what motivates people. And most people have goals and if they don't, they should. Um, yeah. and, and it's, it's working towards those goals and helping people work towards those goals uh, that, that, that I've found is a good way to connect with people as well. So. Absolutely. Yeah. If you can connect um, with people on a common goal and then also like maybe you take the lead and share something personal about yourself, like push yourself to be a little bit vulnerable, then you invite other people to do the same with you. Yeah, definitely. Well, so I, I'm going a little bit off track here. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about this motivation and, and management and, and helping people learn, grow and succeed. Well, so mm-hmm. you've managed a bunch of different types of roles. You've managed SDRs and AEs and account managers and CSMs and rev hops. And like, you know, yeah. you, uh, you, you've collected the, the Thanos power gauntlet of, of man of sales management. How does managing each of those roles differ? And w- what advice would you give to people who are maybe even switching? Cause you've, you've done that context switching pretty regularly. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, so I have, I've managed a lot of different functions over, over my career how they differ is the delineation of responsibilities. That's an easy answer. It's, Hey, what are, what are my goals and how can I achieve them? So, and making sure that everybody understands what they do versus what they don't do. So if I'm coaching an AE, it's going to be all about generating revenue activities, pipeline velocity, et cetera, versus a CSM. I'm going to go more, I'm going to go more of a account prioritization exercise. And how can we go from being reactive and being slave to our inbox to being more of a strategic advisor? I think what's the same is it's really my job to provide people context and autonomy to do their role successfully, whatever that function is that they're doing get out of their way in terms of the actually doing of the things and help them move blockers internally. So, I mean, the roles and responsibilities on any job description will highlight the differences, but the similarities are are to me, like what has led to my success across leadership. And, and so it's interesting to say that there was more similarities than there are differences. Do you find that there are any differences across seniority, people who are fresh out of college? I mean, I've managed 21 year olds, fresh out of college. I've managed 45 year olds who've been working in the industry for 25 years. Do you have any, are there any differences there? I'm trying yeah, to find differences, I, Jacob. Tell me, give me some differences. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So like, I mean, I, there's a, there's an SDR who just joined my team who's like fresh out of college and there's a, there's the, what is health insurance conversation versus yeah. someone who has, uh, who ha- I had a, an account manager on my team at the la- my last company who had two kids in college and it's like very different life stages and so the difference there is number one like the mental furniture or experiences that they're bringing to to the role and both are equally valid and both can be beneficial in their own ways but it's also the motivations and where you are just like in your life as a person um so again we talked about motivation earlier like making sure that you understand who is this person what drives them what's their relationship with their work and what do they want out of this thing though those are the key differences to focus on in my experience that's cool that's great and then so now we're going to go backwards again uh sure. to the last to the last thing that you said which is succeed what is success i mean success in sales is pretty obvious it's yeah dollar signs um but what does success look like for you when you are leading and, and mentoring someone there's a few different things that jump to mind here. Number one, like identifying weaknesses and, and working on them as well as your strengths. So mastery is one thing that comes to mind. I think identifying people like how people want to grow and helping them execute on a, on a concrete plan to get there is success, whether that's a revenue target, whether that's a, Hey, like I want to make sure that I have, I run the best discovery calls on the team. If success to me looks like it, establishing those overarching goals, but don't forget like the little goals along the way. And, and so success can happen on a daily, weekly, monthly, over the course of your life cadence. One of the things that I think is, is comprises that success is helping people get into the next role that they want, whether that's on my team or not. For me, again, like <laughs> I don't want people to work for me or from on my team forever. Like I want people to use growth as a driver for that success. So it's my job to to help them, whether that's move up, move laterally. It's my job to like for a while they're on my team. It's my job to help them choose their own adventure and come up with a concrete plan to get there. 
That's great. I used to tell my SDRs that it was my job to hire them and then get them off my team as quickly yeah. as possible. So I uh, I appreciate that. And, and and so it sounds like for you, success is what the person that you're coaching wants it to be. Um, mm-hmm. For some people, it's buying a house. For some people, it's getting promoted. For some people, it's you know, just doing a good job. And so it sounds like yeah. if you try to shoehorn everybody into one view of success, which is, you know, maybe your view of success or everybody else you've managed view of success, you're going to struggle with the people who don't fit that exact mold. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so like, and I, that's not to say that we don't have bit, we don't have business objectives to hit. Of course sure, we do. Like sure, we're, sure. we're, in, we're in a for-profit business that, and we are a sales team. Uh, yeah. So we need to generate revenue. That said, like, I see the revenue generation as a driver for that that personal success. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the 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 revenue generation is a symptom of you know it's a, it's a it's an outcome of hitting those goals. Uh, yeah. Ideally their goals are related to revenue generation otherwise right. what are you doing in sales? So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, so we are coming up on time here. I have three questions that I ask every guest. And by that, I mean the two guests, <laughs> you and the uh, the f- previous guests that I've had. Um, first off is what piece of advice would you give yourself on your first day working in sales? You're going to fail. Mm. That's okay. Failure is a good thing. Okay. Did you struggle with that early on? Yeah. Well, so you, I, I mean, maybe you still struggle with it. I don't know. A little, a little bit. I mean, I think anybody who says they're completely comfortable with failure is uh, like not being wholly truthful, at least in my experience. But I think for me, like when I was 23 years old, I'd had a ton. I hadn't done anything new in a long time. Like I had done school for 16 years. I'd done sports my whole life. Like I hadn't tried anything completely new in quite a while. And so I had unrealistic expectations of myself coming into my first sales role. And so I shied away from failure. I viewed it as this thing that wouldn't contribute directly to my growth. Interesting. Did you ever try to, I, I speaking from experience, I would even try to hide failure or, or yeah. obfuscate it or like brush it under the rug. If I, you know, the classic is like, keep an opportunity open, keep a qualified yeah. opportunity open way too long because you don't want the embarrassment of closing it out. Hmm. Yeah. I think for me, one of the things that I, one of the reasons I gravitate towards startups specifically is you cannot hide failure and yeah. you have to lean in. It's a, it's a forcing function. Like you have to lean into the failure. This is true. This is true. Um, cool. Uh, it's really good advice. So question number two, if you weren't in sales, what else would you be doing? Ooh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, okay. so I like, I, I mean, I love animals. I love nature. I love like being outside. So I think I, I want to say veterinarian that would probably require me to be a little bit better at science than I was. Uh, yeah, I'll go with that. Okay. All right. That's good. Yeah. I, I, I am too afraid of, uh, like needles and blood and like being a vet seems fun until you realize that like, you also have to deal with sick animals constantly. Yeah. That's not fun. So I, I'd be like, oh, I'm a vet, but only for healthy animals, only doing regular checkups on on, on animals. So. Yeah. Well, I do have three dogs now, so my house has very quickly become a zoo. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it absolutely has. I have two, and that's that feels like too many at times. So yeah. Um, all right. Lastly, what are you watching, reading, and or listening to right now? And Reminder, this can be work-related or it can be uh, Korean drama like it was for Lily last week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so for me, again, like not directly correlated to sales leadership, but I, I have been, I've been binging a ton of the uh, Andrew Huberman's podcast. So he's a uh, professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford Med, like super smart guy. Uh, and one, he has a podcast out there about like optimizing your work environment. That's really interesting, as well as how can you make sure that your eating and sleep schedules, like optimize the chemicals in your brain. So I think that's really interesting to me. And like, call that biohacking, call that like living intentionally. That to me has been a really interesting podcast that I, that I've kind of nerded out on. You know, the, you know, the name of it off the top of your head. I think it's Andrew Huberman labs. Oh, easy. Not very creative. Any, uh, (laughs) yeah, well, sales nerds live. So, um, any, um, any quick tips that you have from that? Like the, the work environment side Mm, that people can, can pick up, get a desk lamp and expose yourself to sunlight early in your day. 
Okay. Yeah. So uh, like make sure that your workstation is very bright in the morning. Uh, and typically your brain is wired to uh, do a lot more like analytical, like outcome based work in the morning versus free form, like creative thinking is better suited for the afternoon. Interesting. I find that my most creative times are when I wake up at like two in the morning and can't fall back asleep. I, I will I have a bunch of notes of just like random things that I've yeah. scrolled down on my phone at two in the morning. So uh, I'm with you. All right, cool. And, and you were going to say something else. So one, yeah. Another thing that you're watching or, or listening to. Well, it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure, uh, but I'm watching the new season of the Bachelorette. Uh, and so we've got like a pick em league here at work. Uh, shameless plug for the Bachelor Nation Slack channel. If you're at Occupier and watching this. Uh, but for me, like, I, it's a guilty pleasure. I love watching it with my wife. Yeah. Like I, I hate that I love it so much. Is one thing yeah. I want to say about it. Yeah, you curl up on the couch with the three dogs and and watch them battle for it. I've never, I've dogs. never gotten into it. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's trash TV, but it's super entertaining and a great way to kind of wind down. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, awesome. Well, any any parting thoughts? Anything else before we we let the the crowd go here? Oh man. Um, I think the last thing that I'll say is like one of the things that has led to my success or one of the things that I attribute most to my success thus far in my career. And I've had a lot of failures in my career too, is approaching things with a mindset of abundance rather than, rather than scarcity. And the second thing that I'll say there is like, we think so much about what could go wrong in your life. Think about what could go right by trying something new or experimenting or connecting with that person. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say, effort and attitude are the two things you can control in your life there you go you have to end with an idiom here so yeah um excellent well no that's 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 great great feedback and um this was a really fun conversation awesome thanks so much for having me i appreciate it yeah thank you talk soon cool later y'all